Keeping kayfabe alive isn't an easy thing to do nowadays, especially when there's that necessity to stay connected with your fans on a regular basis and with half the business being conducted on social media. You know, there's promotions, there's online events, there's online signings, etc. What I'm saying is that conducting the wrestling business through social media was kind of this cool little extra on the side. You know, people could promote um, upcoming events, appearances, signings, their merch, etc. But in the year 2020, that would all get turned upside down. I don't think I need to tell you about the COVID pandemic and how it basically crippled a lot of businesses in so many different ways. People were losing jobs because well, everything was shut down. You can go to a movie, you can hang out with friends, you can go out to eat anywhere, and you damn sure can watch any live sports, or any wrestling for that matter. Now everything, and I mean everything, had to be moved online, including wrestling shows. Yep, gone were the casual fans, and now they were directly catering to I'm talking to you, Heyman Rules 512! And a lot of these wrestling companies were faced with the question of how the fuck do we generate revenue without selling any tickets, any merch, any tours, or anything? Where do we go from here? And it wasn't just one or two shows either. In Japan, it... well, actually, come to think of it, Japan has just kind of been this revolving door of going in and out of lockdown and in and out of state of emergency. And only recently did they roll out the vaccine because of the Olympics and the good chunk of the population that isn't vaccinated yet. Look, this is a discussion for another time. My point is, is that there were some big changes that needed to be made in order to just fucking survive now, especially for the smaller companies. But with risk comes opportunity. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's the saying. And now, there was a chance to appease a bunch of international fans who were also stuck at home like the rest of us. So now, it's a race across the ocean to snatch a bigger piece of that international pie, which was great for me because I'm an international fan, which means that these companies were all catering to me now and forced to do my bidding. And out from the ashes rose a phoenix. And the phoenix name was Jean Grey. Chocolate Pro. Choco Pro. And this kind of started out as a little kind of side project from Emi Sakura's main promotion, Gato Move which is based out of Thailand at the time and kind of moved his base of operations to Japan, I believe. That's how it began, at least. And their motto was, and still is, no paywall. Every show was available on YouTube to watch for free, and they kept the shows on their backlog, too. And these shows are purely being funded through donations, whether it's through their online Patreon, through their website, through the various merch that they have, or just simply super chats. Or and they were running not just weekly, but almost daily shows all throughout 2020. And even when they didn't have a live show that day, they usually kept the interaction going with their fan base with various live streams on their off days, or sometimes on the same days. It was just a constant barrage of content and it was great. Which would then set off a trend for other wrestling companies doing the same thing. Live streams with fans, live wrestling shows online with no audience, the memes and just keeping that bond and that interaction going in general. It's almost as if everyone was like, oh my god, th 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 this thing, it, 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 it has internet and, 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 and it goes out to the world? Maybe. Maybe we could send wrestling out to the world. Choco Pro would emanate from the Ichigaya Chocolate Square, which is um, uh, basically a room on the ground floor, and 
people get thrown out of windows and it's not exactly a big room either and it has a single camera setup which is usually someone's phone and no real audio setup so it's loud oh my god it is loud like i've seen people walking through the alleyways and shit on their way to work and Okay, let's address the elephant in the room right now. The wrestling is really silly, really unorthodox, and just downright weird. Like, you remember those old SmackDown vs Raw games where you could go backstage and just go to all these random places and just do some insane shit? Yeah, Amy Sakura made her a whole ass brand about that. <laughs> Dude, it gets really fucking wild. But you might be thinking, oh well, it's probably just some no-names coming through the door, right? Maybe some small kind of indie-ish indie names that we haven't really heard of. And sometimes, yeah, but let me just tell you this. Semi Sakura has quite the little black book on her. Hey, 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 daijoku, daijoku. How do you get them? Hey. Hey, Eric, I got to. Eh. Eh. Hey. Genki desu ka? Hey, hey, genki desu. Kyo wa shigota desu ka? Shigota desu nai. Jigai no ah wrestling show arimasu. Issho ni ikimasen ka? Rocky's gonna love this shit. Minoru Suzuki on the very first fucking episode of Chuckle Pro. Yeah, that little black book it has. It's got something. And usually, Emi Sakura announces the card late. Like, super late. Like, barely 12 hours before the show late. But honestly, it just gives you that suspense and this magic of like, oh shit, you never know who might turn up. And even then, she doesn't really rely on the big stars coming through the door to draw viewers. Since there's plenty going on with their own ensemble. And they have their own stories going too. And it's not just relying on special attractions. And this maintains both avid viewers and brings back the casual viewers too. I mean, Lula Pencil is easily one of the most endearing characters they have. And she's had some amazing stories going on throughout 2020. And honestly, I just love the unpredictability of it all. And again, it's all free, so... And believe it or not, they've been quietly running shows alongside WWE and AEW throughout the pandemic. And they just keep going from strength to strength. And eventually they became so popular, they were able to run shows in empty arenas and even travel across Japan to collaborate with other promotions. And even then, 
they've even split the team up so the Choco Pro Keeper running in one team, running at the square, while the other team makes appearances at other promotions. And it's just like, holy shit, yo, that is insane. So yeah, that's Choco Pro in a nutshell. Oh no, 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 wait, wait, wait. They also have a Junkin tournament. If you know what Junkin is, it's basically rock, paper, scissors, and uh, it includes pretty much everyone that was there. And at the end, the winner gets, you guessed it, chocolate or choco. And it's a weird way for people who lost their matches to actually get their heat back or for people who won to keep their momentum going. And in a lot of cases, it's even more intense than the wrestling itself. And this brings me to my personal ace of Choco Pro, Mei Saruka. I hope you don't mind if I just flex a little bit here and tell you that I actually met Mesa Ruga about two years ago at Eve Pro Wrestling in London when I think she was just starting out or just over a year into her career and honestly she's the sweetest kid in the world and has only gotten better and better since then. She just has this infectious charisma and drive. Oh and uh, just because she's small doesn't mean she wants to square up to you like she's fucking scrappy do or some shit. And her insane stamina and speed, like, dude, she legit runs circles around you, literally. And she just goes all in on everything, including the story, the characters, and just does everything she can to bring the best out of everyone. But for me, her real talent lies with, be with her ability to be able to compartmentalize all of this and channel it into a completely different character. Enter Maison Michel, who I talked about briefly in my Miu vs. Maki video. But basically, Mei Surugam actually made an appearance at Wrestle Princess in a tag team match, teaming up with Moka Miyamoto against Shiori Sena and Suzume. But ultimately lost when Moka was defeated by Suzume when she hit the ring a bell. And Mei Suruga was never seen again. Well, actually, she just went back to Choco Bro, you know, business as usual. But also on that show was Saki Akai, who apparently is friends with Sakisama, and not too long after this, Sakisama actually returned to Tokyo Joshi with her new assistant in tow, Mei San Michelle, dressed in a blade outfit and brandishing a deadly cocktail tray. Oh, and she has those red streaks in her hair. Look, I'm not saying anything here, I just find this all very interesting. Okay, for real, this whole thing just kind of speaks to how talented Mei really is. Because Mei San Michelle isn't just Mei Suruga in a maid's outfit. Because she completely disappears into this role. Mei Suruga is undoubtedly the natural baby face. Vibrant, colorful, proud, charismatic, and headstrong and just full of happy and bright energy. And regardless of how big and tough her opponents are, or frankly how more experienced they might be than her, she's fiercely loyal to her friends and family of Choco Pro. Almost to a fault. And sometimes Mace Roga gets a little overconfident, a little overzealous, and it's almost Gotenks levels of, dude, what the fuck are you doing? And then, when she transforms into Mace and Michelle, She's the complete opposite. Sneaky, conniving, and low energy. To the point of almost being cowardly, and honestly, it's kind of unsettling how much she changes everything. But there is one thing that she maintains, and it's kind of connected to Mesa Ruga as well, and that is the loyalty 
to those around her, except for Maison Michel, its loyalty and devotion to Sakisama. She completely changes up her characteristics and her mannerisms and just in general the way she moves around the ring. And she just has this air of unpredictability to her. Like you really don't know what she's gonna pull out of a little bag of tricks. And honestly, it's better to keep your distance because usually she'll catch you before you catch her. It's very Harley Quinn-esque in that way and I, God, I actually, I just love it. And going back to the kayfabe thing, this maintaining the mystique of Mesa Michelle isn't just exclusive to the ring either because Mesa Rugo does everything she can to maintain the mystique in that she does nothing. She barely acknowledges the character at all, online or in person, and if she does, it's usually in the third person, and Mesa Michelle doesn't have a Twitter account either. And God, I think it's great, and it's even better when the fans play along too. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you, Rahi. Mesa Michelle signed yesterday. She was nice. Oh, good for you. But again, going to the effort adds so much because we still don't know that much about Mesa and Michelle. We don't know who she really is, where she came from, and you know, what a connection to Sakisama really is. So, you know, it's something they can play with down the line. And even if they don't, it's okay because I personally think it's cool. Till I see the end 